Very little is known of the Titans, much less the younger Titans, those who are believed to have dominion over the world's more natural features, such as the sea, the earth, the sky, or in today's episode, the air. Lelantos, a more ethereal god than we've come to expect, was thought to have been formless, or at least moved unseen through the world, much as the wind does. Yet, as we still today feel the wind through our hair or against our skin, the ancient Greeks once attributed such a sensation to the presence of Lelantos. As the etymology of his name goes, Lelantos was believed to have derived from the Greek words Lethor, Lanthano, and Lelathon, meaning to either escape or to move unseen. This would make sense given Lelantos' association with the wind, that which is unseen. It might also link in with Lelantos' association with hunting, where he was also believed to be a deity who assisted hunters in the wild, aiding them in their attempts to move upon prey without detection. Despite being relatively unknown in the mythology, his parentage would suggest otherwise. His father was said to have been the titan Coius, he who was a titan of inquisitive minds and questioning, as well as one of the four essential pillars of the world during the reign of the once almighty Cronus. Lelantis' mother, meanwhile, was Phoebe, the titan goddess of bright intellect. With this in mind, it would suggest that Lelantos was something of a long-lost sibling to the titans Leto and Asteria. However, an accurate family tree of the wind deity is yet to be established, especially given how he appears to be overlooked by many Greek writers and poets. In this, there may be a suggestion that as the air, or a physical representation of it, Lelantos was not necessarily born to the world, but was always a part of it, having manifested from the atmosphere. Though this would contradict his classification as a second generation titan. Another interesting idea presents Lelantos as the male counterpart to the titan Leto, the goddess of motherhood. This comes about due to the fact that Aura, the daughter of Lelantos, was considered to be the counterpart to Leto's daughter, Artemis. The sources, however, are not concrete on this idea, and no writer makes any real association to such a claim. The closest we get to any writer really exploring Lelantos at all is the epic Greek poet Nonus, who speaks of the god in his Dionysiaca, though even here, much of the focus is aimed towards his daughter Aura. We are told, There in Phrygia grew Aura, the mountain maiden of Rindacus, and hunted over the foothills of rocky Dindimon. She was unacquainted with love, like a younger Artemis, this daughter of Lelantos, for the father of this stormfoot girl was ancient Lelantos, the Titan, who wedded Periboia, a daughter of Oceanus, a man like maid she was, who knew nothing of Aphrodite. Here we are told of Aura, the daughter of Lelantos, who Nonus explains was like a younger version of Artemis. It is by a daughter of Oceanus in Periboia that Lelantos was believed to have been married to, and it was through her that Aura was conceived. There's an implication here by Nonus that Aura was by no means a looker. Indeed, he specifies that Aura had the look and build of a man, and that she knew nothing of Aphrodite, or that she was far from beautiful. Whilst not specified here by Nonus, we also understand that Aura did indeed take after her father, for whilst he was considered to be a god of the winds, she was once considered to be a goddess of the breeze. This is concurrent with other offspring of deities, who would either adopt a portion of their parents' dominion, or usurp the entire dominion for themselves. In Aura's case, it would seem she only embraced a portion of her father's power, the breeze to be more specific, and did not appear to possess the ambition to seek more. Lelantos certainly falls into one of the more awkward and shamefully overlooked periods of Greek mythology. As a second generation titan, he wasn't recognised as a primordial, or any sort of originator, 
and he didn't serve in any capacity during the Great Titanomachy. Essentially, Lelantos would be one of the many Titans who were ultimately overshadowed by the dominion of Zeus. However, you might say that his invisibility during this period is quite fitting to his character, a god who, like the air, goes unseen. Moreover, given that he was believed to be the aid of hunters, or an essence that represented their necessary stealth and vigilance that a hunter would require, him being relatively removed from the narrative would make sense, and may even have been by his own design. Indeed, it is believed by some scholars that the presence of Lelantos could have been more significant, but because he personified the formless state of the wind, he would not have been perceived. It's not uncommon that in a world as vast and vivid as Greek mythology, that some gods would outshine others, and some, like Lelantos, would get left by the wayside. It's an unfortunate truth when we look at any ancient mythology, that there may be no retribution for some of these sideline deities, especially with the more interesting ones, such as Lelantos. Indeed, the only surviving account of Lelantos does appear to be from Nonus's Dionysiaca, but beyond this, we may never know the true meaning behind Lelantos as either a god who aided hunters or a god who controlled the winds. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Additionally, if you like Greek mythology as much as I do, you might want to check out a copy of our book, Greek Mythology Explained, where we retell a few of our favourite myths and explore the meanings and themes behind them. With that being said, I hope you all have a good evening and I'll see you in the next one. Until next time.